Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Caitlin and I upload a whole bunch of different types of videos on this channel, mainly surrounding true crime and psychological cases and all things education related. So for today's video, we're back discussing another true crime case. And for today's case, we're going to be discussing that of Morgan Nick. I'm just going to be covering all of the details of her case, her disappearance and everything along those lines. But before we get started, I just want to run through my regular disclaimer that I like to include just at the start of all my videos. So I just want to let you guys know that I'm not claiming to be an expert in this case or any of the other cases I cover over on my channel. I'm simply relaying the information I'm able to find myself through research on the internet. And because obviously I'm relying on certain sources that are accessible to me it means I may get things wrong, mispronounce things or leave things out and I apologise if I do do any of those things. I'm not trying to cause anyone any harm or an injustice, I'm just simply working with the information that I have available to me. So with all that being said we shall just go ahead and get started discussing the case of Morgan Nick. Morgan Chantel Nick was born on September 12th in the year of 1988 in a place called Ozark in Arkansas in the United States. Now Ozark was a rather small town with a particularly close-knit community as usually is the case with these smaller towns. When Morgan was around two years old, her family welcomed her younger brother, his name was Logan, into the world and not long after that followed her younger sister Taryn. I couldn't find loads of information on Morgan's upbringing and especially since her case occurred when she was so young, there's not a lot of information because she didn't really get to experience a lot of life but Morgan Nick is remembered as being a creative and vibrant young girl. She had very light blonde hair and bright blue eyes, she was an absolutely stunning little girl and from a young age she was known to have a lot of aspirations in life so she was quite an incredible um, dreamer really. She had all of these occupations that she just wanted to do so this could be anything from being a doctor to joining a circus to being an athlete. She was a very imaginative and very driven young girl. So when Morgan started attending school she decided to join the track team because at that point she had been going down the route of she wanted to grow up to become an athlete but very soon she decided that it wasn't really something she actually wanted to do and so instead she signed up for the local Girl Scouts troop where she would um, meet loads of other young girls around the same sort of age as her from the same area and they would do loads of different activities and she'd just get to meet a new group of friends really, spend time with these young girls that maybe she didn't know through school. Morgan is remembered as the funny, creative and motivated character that she was from such a young age and she absolutely loved to make people laugh and one thing that was listed in a lot of the sources that I read um, remembered that Morgan was absolutely obsessed with the family's new young kitten. She loved the kitten to pieces and spent so much of her time showing her love and affection towards the pet. On June the 9th in the year of 1995, six-year-old Morgan and her mother Colleen Nick decided to head out to spend the evening together watching a little league baseball game in a place called Alma in Arkansas. This area was just 30 minutes away from the town of Ozark that they lived in and so like I said it was a close-knit community, it wasn't far to travel and Alma was very similar in size so so everyone sort of was quite familiar and friendly with one another. The pair had decided to spend the evening as just the two of them to have what Colleen had described as being a girl's night out. Morgan's grandmother had happily agreed to babysit the other two young children at home while the pair went out and just spent a bit of time together. At this Little League baseball game there was believed to have been around 300 people there that evening from people watching to also the people participating in the game with the majority if not all of the attendees being particularly familiar with one another like I said since it was such a small close-knit community. At around 10.30 that evening while the game was still going on two young girls their names were Jessica who was eight and Ty who was ten from around the area that the game was kind of taking place in. They had approached Colleen and Morgan and asked them if Morgan could join them in playing nearby just while the game was going on and there's a group of kids playing and they wanted to ask if Morgan could join them. At first Colleen had refused to let Morgan go just simply because they had wanted to spend the evening together. She told Morgan that you know they'd come out together so they, she wanted to spend a bit of time with her daughter um, and it was also getting quite late at this point. But as I'm sure you can imagine as a lot of young kids do Morgan began begging her mother to let her join the girls and the other children and eventually 
Colleen gave in, considering the game was nearly finishing, um, and she just gave them the one condition that if Morgan was to go with them, they must only play within eyesight. A quote from Colleen that I'd found during my research, um, this quote came from specifically unsold.com's coverage of the case. Um, she'd said, finally, against my better judgment, I told her that she could go and play. And she threw her arms around my neck and gave me a big hug. We could see them very clearly. And the last time I turned to look, Morgan was running back and forth playing. Some sources that I read had specified that Morgan had been seen at some point trying to chase and catch fireflies with some of the other children and then they were just letting them go so they were kind of just running around being kids having fun. The area that the children had been playing in was close to the car park area where they were playing the little league baseball game um, and it was by a well-lit street so there were street lamps by all of the cars that had been parked so there didn't seem to be any cause for concern at the time. And as I'm sure you can imagine throughout the time that the children had been playing Colleen and I'm sure a lot of the other parents were whose kids were running around um, they would check over regularly just look over glance over to see how they're getting on and all seemed well from Colleen's perspective for the rest of the game. Around 15 minutes later, as the baseball game was finishing, the two girls that had invited Morgan to join them in playing had returned towards the bleachers, obviously to meet their families while the game was ending, but Morgan was nowhere to be seen. And I mean, immediately, this is obviously not really much cause for concern. There was a group of kids playing, so Morgan could have just been a straggler, still playing, uh, got on lost track of time. She hadn't noticed maybe that the other girls had left. And so when Colleen had asked the two girls where they'd left Morgan, the girl said that they'd last seen her near a car trying to get sand out of her shoes. So initially Colleen headed towards her parked car to see if Morgan had been somewhere nearby. She didn't re Possibly she'd recognised her own car and waited there for her mother to leave in the hordes of parents sort of leaving the area. She looked around the outside of where it was parked and then she looked inside to see if somehow she climbed into the car. She looked underneath the car in the hopes that maybe she'd crawled underneath one of the parked cars but within minutes most of the families had headed back to their cars and driven away and there was still no sign of Morgan. Pauline at this point had immediately become panicked and she started running around to each of the families that were left asking them if they'd seen Morgan, if they'd seen any little girl that was maybe stood by herself that maybe had gotten lost or couldn't see her mother. Another person who'd actually been at the baseball field had used their phone to ring 911 and police officers were dispatched immediately to aid the initial hunt for this missing six-year-old girl. Obviously Colleen at that point was terrified, she was frantic looking for her daughter but at that point, when you're trying to remain calm, a lot of people are just saying she's she's here somewhere. She's obviously just wandered off. We'll find her. While waiting for the authorities to arrive, one of the coaches at the game had actually spoken to the two young girls that had been last seen playing with Morgan. And they said they remembered seeing a man talking to Morgan while they were playing nearby. The girls were obviously young and they hadn't really been paying attention. So they weren't really able to provide much detail into this unknown man's appearance, but both of them had used the term creepy to describe him and that was kind of the initial impression they got of him when he had initially approached them while they were all playing. According to what they could get from these two young girls, this man had allegedly been standing by an old red Ford pickup truck that had a white camper attached to the back of it. And like I said, the girls really hadn't initially thought much of it because they weren't sort of given any reason to be concerned for her. They hadn't seen her leave with the man. And like I said earlier, the last sighting that they'd had of her was her alone trying to get sand out of her shoes. So it's not like she'd been seen getting into this man's car by these two young girls. Um, and the two young girls had just simply headed back to their parents when they noticed the game was ending because all the kids were doing so, so people began leaving. But even once the police had arrived just six minutes later and parents had been out searching for Morgan around the area, there remained absolutely no sign of her. Authorities initially began to carry out on-spot interviews of any witnesses who had been at the game and who'd hung around to sort of see this chaos ensue while they were searching for this missing girl, um, just in the hopes that maybe someone could confirm the account of this unidentified man that was given by the two girls or even someone saying oh no that was so and so he's no worry anything really realistically in the hopes of being able to either build on the description of the appearance of this unknown man or 
or ruling him out completely. Additional details collected from eyewitnesses in the area meant that the police could narrow down that they had been looking for a Caucasian male placed at being in his early 20s to late 30s, standing at around six foot tall and weighing around 180 pounds. He was allegedly seen to have had black and grey slicked back hair with a distinctive prominent moustache and beard. They were also led to believe that the vehicle he was seeing hovering by had curtains inside covering all of the windows and there was noticeable damage on the passenger side of the truck. This unknown man remained the prime suspect in the case of Morgan Nick's disappearance and due to the information given, law enforcement had immediately treated the case as an abduction and this classification was then later supported when they learned of an incident seemingly related that had occurred earlier on in the same day not far from where Morgan's case occurred. In the very same small town just hours before Morgan's disappearance it was reported that an unidentified male in a red pickup truck had approached a four-year-old girl and attempted to encourage her to climb inside his vehicle. The perpetrator's abduction attempt had been interrupted when the young girl's mother had spotted the man approaching her daughter and made a commotion in order for other people to be alerted that were nearby and so obviously he got spooked and drove away. And obviously this wasn't confirmed as being related in any way. It may have just been a very, very unfortunate coincidence of these two incidents happening in the same area on the same day, but it just doesn't seem like something that would likely happen. There wasn't a lot of details about the perpetrator of this initial um, incident that was reported, so there's no way of knowing exactly whether it was the same person, but it does seem as though there is a particularly likely connection between the two. To add to this, the day after Morgan's disappearance, another similar incident was reported. According to this account, an unknown male matching the description of the one involved in Morgan's case had attempted to lure a nine-year-old girl into a men's restroom inside a convenience store in the nearby area of Fort Smith in Arkansas. This was just 15 minute drive away from the area in which Morgan's case took place. Once again, it's not known at all whether this incident is even remotely related to the other two cases, but it does seem like an entirely possible or plausible chance. In the months following her daughter's disappearance and believed abduction, Colleen Nick had been adamant that she would not settle back into her regular life while her daughter was still out there and while the search for her six-year-old was still underway. She actually moved into a building which was the volunteer fire station and it was located just next door to the local police building and she spent her days spreading the word of Morgan's story and Morgan's case and just aiding the search for her daughter in every possible way. She made posters and plastered them up all over the area giving them to anyone who was in the town passing through anywhere that she could leave these posters, she would make sure that they were within everyone's sight. During these initial weeks following Morgan's disappearance, law enforcement professionals had pieced together a composite sketch of this prime suspect involved in the case. And this composite sketch was very, very swiftly picked up by local media outlets as a way of spreading awareness and continuing the search for Morgan. I think as in a lot of these cases, because they would take place in such a small, close, community and such a young child going missing everyone kind of bands together and wants to help out as much as they can because it does hit close to home for a lot of people. Following the broadcast of this sketch, law enforcement received more than 4,000 tips claiming to have been related to the case in some way and, and people offering potential perpetrators they were searching for, thinking they may have looked like this man. But even with such an extensive amount of information being provided by the public and leading to numerous leads for them to chase up, sadly none of them led anywhere. For years after Morgan Nick's disappearance, there remained no new information regarding what had happened to the young girl, what could have potentially been done, but her mother refused to believe that a daughter could have just vanished into thin air and she worked so hard to keep her story and the search for her daughter going. Colleen Nick continued to not only campaign for her daughter's name and story to remain in the public eye in order for the search to be continued, but she also became a public campaigner to aid missing children and their families to provide them with as much support as she could. In the year of 1996, she actually created a non-profit organisation called the Morgan Nick Foundation, which is still active to this day. According to their Facebook page, they aim to educate 
state and aid families, members of law enforcement and youth leadership figures in the fight to prevent cases of missing and exploited children. The Morgan Nick Amber Alert system was also introduced by the Arkansas State Police to interrupt statewide programs across television and radio broadcasts in order to inform members of the area of that state of a child's disappearance within that area and giving them any details they might need to aid the search and keep an eye out to obviously try and return this child as safely as possible as quickly as possible and this is obviously based on the traditional amber alert system that is used in many areas across the country. The search for answers in Morgan's case continued and then in 2001 the case fell back into the public eye. An updated composite sketch of the believed perpetrator so this prime suspect from those years before that was initially seen talking to Morgan and approaching Morgan was sent out to media outlets in addition to an age fit image that was produced of Morgan just so people were aware of what she would likely look like since the years had passed as at that point she would be around 12 years old. And that very same year Unsolved Mysteries actually dedicated part of their programming so they covered the case um, of Morgan's disappearance and publicly obviously broadcasted that and the show is huge so it does provide a lot of coverage and it brings a lot of light to these cases that maybe um, hadn't been seen past the local area so it initially had occurred in this small town but because of this broadcast a huge amount of interest and focus had been brought onto this case that had initially started in such a small area. From this new tips and leads were brought forward and obviously investigated by law enforcement those years later. One notable tip that was received around this time had claimed that Morgan's remains would be found in a place called Boonville in Arkansas. They specified that the remains would be found on an area of private property. And because the tip had provided um, some specific details about how they would find these remains, what would happen, as well as uh, matching up with kind of the timings of the case, that led law enforcement to place huge amounts of validity and credibility on this tip. So they believed this could be something that was a major break in the case. And as a result, a swift search of the location was carried out on January the 15th in 2002. Professionals had spent an entire day thoroughly searching the area and digging up as much ground as possible. But at 9.30 p.m. that day, they called off the search as it had resulted in no new information whatsoever. There was no indication of anyone having been here, let alone alone finding any signs of human remains. And these tips would continue to come in for years after Morgan's disappearance, but sadly as new tips and new leads come forward and they are investigated, they continue to fail to shed any light into what happened to Morgan Nick. On November the 16th in 2010, an unrelated investigation in Spyro in Oklahoma had led local law enforcement to a trailer home that had once been owned by a convicted child molester. At the time of these investigators being taken to this mobile home, the individual, this person, had been serving a prison sentence for his crimes. But it's an interesting point of discussion in the investigation because this area that this trailer home had been in had only been around a 35 minute journey from Alma and the individual had allegedly been considered an active person of interest in the early days of Morgan's investigation due to the proximity and because of his previous offences. No definitive connections could have been made at the time, however, law enforcement no definitive connections could have been made at the time, however, law enforcement had not completely dismissed the potential connection. And the next update in Morgan Nick's case came about in June of 2012, so Morgan at this point would be in her 20s. A woman named Tonya Renee Smith from Hollister in Missouri, upon being released from Louisiana State Prison, had attempted to depict herself as the missing child. She was 24 years old at the time, around the same age that Morgan would be, and she had managed to obtain a birth certificate amongst other seemingly legitimate documents that would um, support her claims of this identity so she had the ability to go forward and claim that she was Morgan Nick. However, because of the ongoing investigation relating to Morgan's disappearance, law enforcement had been immediately alerted in August of that year when it was clocked that someone was living and um, going about day-to-day -day life using the missing girl's identity. Tonya was arrested in Missouri before serving 120 days in Pulaski County Jail. I apologise if I mispronounced that. 
In the following year, she was found guilty on a computer fraud charge and as a result received a six year probation sentence with a $2,500 fine. I honestly can't even imagine how awful it must have been for Morgan's loved ones to have learned that someone was using Morgan's name and identity when they were holding out hope that she was still out there somewhere alive and well. I can't imagine what that must have been like. For some years, there was little to no change in the investigation until December of 2017. Police investigators had received a particularly detailed tip relating to a water well being involved in Morgan's case and as a result they headed back to carry out a search of the trailer home that I'd mentioned previously of the convicted child molester in Spyro in Oklahoma because it was relating to this tip and this water well. There wasn't a lot of detail about this tip specifically but seemingly they're all related and so they headed back to this trailer home but this time in the search of finding something relating to Morgan's case. The property had obviously been searched years prior but this tip was relating to the water well specifically had prompted the search um, and this time they'd taken a number of cadaver dogs with them and as well as a team of professionals combing through looking for any relation to Morgan Nick's case, even just any little pieces of evidence that suggested they could be related, that there was some credibility to this tip. Sadly, this second search found nothing new. Morgan Nick will be missing for 25 years this year and sadly there remains little to no answers relating to her disappearance. Colleen Nick still continues to carry out fantastic work crusading for not only her daughter's case but also children's safety while keeping her daughter's name in the, in the public eye. She does some fantastic work really focused on educating people and making sure people get the support that they need in cases that are similar to her daughter's. There's a lot of fantastic work going on there. I sincerely hope that one day there will be some answers for Morgan's family's sake and that is where I'm going to end today's video. So thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you found this interesting. Let me know if you've seen any other updates. There's a lot of discussion because with a case like this where there's just not a lot of information, not a lot of solid leads, um, a lot of potential theories been thrown in about timelines and people potentially maybe could be involved so definitely be interested in hearing some of your guys' theories if you've got some but thank you guys so much for watching i hope you found this interesting and i'll see you guys very soon for another video thanks for watching bye